Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flang, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Southampton History Museum. Uh, we are joined this morning again by our Research Center Manager, Mary Cummings. Uh, she's going to be giving a really great lecture today on Dr. T. Gaillard Thomas, one of the maybe founders of Southampton, as we know it today. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about that as Mary begins her talk. But uh, without any further ado, we're going to turn it over to Mary and enjoy everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me for this talk on Dr. T. Gaillard Thomas, who's so often credited as the founder of the Southampton Summer Colony. In a long letter to a friend, which was later published, Dr. T. Gaillard Thomas, a very successful New York City physician, describes the enchantment he felt in 1863 on his first visit to Southampton. He writes that he had been worn out by the cares of a very large practice in the city of New York and had sought leisure and repair of help on a trip to visit Long Island villages accompanied by his wife. He recalls his remarks uh, to her as they were leaving Southampton for home. I'm charmed with this quiet old village, he told her, and by the respectability and apparent worth of the good people who inhabit it. And I'm fully determined that should I ever build a summer home, it shall be located here. Though Thomas didn't mention it in his letter, local legend has it that during his visit to Southampton, he walked seven and a half miles along the beach from Southampton to Watermill in an ecstatic trance. Mesmerized by the surf and the beauty of his surroundings, he fell completely in love with the quaint village's pristine beaches and unspoiled natural environment. No New Yorker himself, Thomas was born in the plantation dominated society of South Carolina's low country on idyllic as Disto Island. His father, uh, the Reverend Everett Thomas, an Episcopalian clergyman and his mother, Jane Marshall Gaillard Thomas, a descendant of Huguenots and a niece of Chief Justice John Marshall, inculcate in their son the standards of conduct and courtly manners of the island's high caste society. By the age of 14, Thomas, bright and already a charismatic personality, is enrolled at Charleston College. After completing his junior year there, he enrolls in the state's medical college in Charleston, where he graduates with highest honors at 21 in 1852, having written his graduate thesis on the efficacy of cod liver oil in consumption. The ambitious young graduate wastes no time before heading to New York City to launch his medical career where some of the nation's leading members of the profession are putting innovative treatments and techniques into practice. Full of youthful adventurousness and no doubt anxious to save money now that he's out on his own, he makes the trip north by signing on to a coastal schooner as a common sailor. Thomas surely has no trouble obtaining a residency at Bellevue Hospital, which is racking up an impressive number of firsts. The first maternity ward, first appendectomy, first ambulance service, but which in 1852 is described by one chronicler as a virtual pest house. Emigration to the United States is at its peak most of the immigrants reaching its shores having fled from the devastating Irish potato famine, packed like sardines in unsanitary conditions. Typhus fever is rampant and from the immigrant stations, many of the sick are immediately transferred to Bellevue, 
which is not equipped for the influx and in dire need of trained positions. Few men, according to one observer, were willing to accept so dangerous an assignment, but Thomas recognized an opportunity and seized it, an action which typified his whole career. When his internship at Bellevue Hospital is complete, Thomas is more than qualified to move on to a position as resident physician at the state emigrant refuge and hospital founded to serve the sick and the indigent on Ward's Island in 1847, and by the 1850s, the biggest hospital complex in the world. There he serves under Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett, another Southerner and a protege of Dr. James Marion Sims, the native South Carolinian who is the towering figure of the Southern born medical fraternity. Sims is a complicated figure in medical history. He was once revered as a pioneer in the development of modern gynecology and as a founder in 1855 of New York's Woman's Hospital, where he performed groundbreaking gynecological surgery to relieve the suffering of many sick women. But today, Sims is widely and rightly condemned for crossing moral boundaries in his experiments on enslaved women. In 2018, his statue was removed from Central Park and relocated in Greenwood Cemetery. In his day, his associates, including T. Gaia Thomas, may not have approved of Sims' methods or used them, but they remained in his orbit and to some extent under his shadow. However dedicated and tire tireless Thomas proved to be in his arduous work at Bellevue and Ward's Island, he's surely thrilled in 1853 to be boarding a ship and heading for Europe for some postgraduate training. He spends a year in Paris visiting hospitals and no doubt making himself welcome among Parisians with his buoyant temperament and social ease. Then it's on to Dublin, where he receives excellent obstetrical training and expert experience in the renowned Rotunda Hospital. In 1855, Thomas is back in New York, ready to begin practicing his profession in earnest. It's not long before his reputation as a rising star and no doubt his Southern upbringing, call him to the attention of the Mississippi-born Dr. John Metcalf. 13 years his senior and ranked among the top practitioners in New York, Metcalf is said to have his finger upon the pulse of fashionable New York. His offer to make Thomas an associate in his very large and prestigious practice gives Thomas the professional standing and financial security uh, that convinced him to settle permanently in the city, where he soon recognized in medical circles as a brilliant and innovative practitioner. He's also an engaging clinical lecturer of rare eloquence, possessing the born orator's rich voice and impressive style. In New York's wider society, he's much admired for his cordiality and courtly manner, not to mention his robust good looks. The next dozen years are very successful for Dr. Thomas, professionally and rather turbulent personally. He maintains a busy schedule in his practice with Metcalf is named visiting ob obstetrician at Bellevue, where he's also uh, teaches a course in diagnosis. And he joins the faculty of obstetric obstetrics at NYU Medical School. His marriage to his distant cousin, Mary Marshall Gaillard in 1856 is a joyous occasion, 
But it ends tragically less than a year later when Mary and her baby die in childbirth. Then when the Civil War seems imminent, Thomas struggles with his dual sympathies. Despite his private opposition to secession and his belief that the Southern course cause is hopeless, he feels his allegiance belongs to the Confederacy and he travels south to enlist. There, most likely suspecting his Northern loyalties, the authorities inform him that he's not needed. On his return to New York, he finds that he has been suspended from the New York Academy of Medicine, ironically as a suspected Southern sympathizer. Later, he's reinstated. The years 1862 and 1863 will see several very important and happy developments in Thomas's life. In 1862, he remarries. His bride, Mary Theodosia Willard, is the granddaughter of the author and founder of the Troy Female Seminary, which was established to provide women with a college education equal to that received by young men. Well matched in every way, the couple's affection will endure and expand to include their children, a son named for his friend, Dr. Metcalf, another son, Edward, who was born crippled and lived with a grandmother until his death in 1901, another son, Howard Lapsley Thomas, and the couple's youngest son, T. Gaillard Thomas IV. Thomas will also expand his professional network in these years, increasing his appointments in 1863 at the Woman's Hospital, where Thomas Ed Emmett, his friend and former colleague at Ward's Island, now dominates as chief surgeon, and at the College of Physicians and Surgeons, where his partner and friend John Metcalf is professor of clinical medicine. He's purposely narrowing his professional work at this time in order to specialize in the relatively new field of gynecology. But most important of all, from our perspective here in Southampton is Dr. Thomas's decision to leave his heavy responsibilities behind for a bit in 1863 and take a vacation. He explains in his letter that he intends to seek leisure and repair of health by venturing onto Long Island where, on a stop in Southampton, he finds paradise. It will be 13 years before Thomas builds his dream house in Southampton. They will be years of his greatest triumphs as lecturer and surgeon the publication in 1868 of his book, A Practical Treatise on the Diseases of Women, will establish him as an international authority in his field. Although gynecology is making great strides, it is still at a rather primitive stage in the late 60s, and records of its progress are scattered. Thomas's textbook compiles the information that will be needed by students and practitioners and the book is translated into five languages and goes through six editions. Meanwhile, Thomas is inventing new life-saving gynecological instruments and surgical techniques, and according to at least one reliable source, becoming, quote, the abortion specialist for New York's top social levels, the best known solver of women's problems. He will later publish his lectures on the subject under the title, Abortion and its Treatment from the Standpoint of Practical Experience. The year 1877 is significant in both Thomas's professional and personal life. It's the year that Listerism, the acceptance of Lister's germ theory of disease, introduces antiseptic measures in the operating room at Women's Hospital, coinciding more or less with the acceptance and availability of anesthesia. With these advances, Thomas's bold surgical innovations become far less risky. 
And it's also in 1877 that Thomas purchases 13 acres of beachfront in Southampton from Charles Goodell and his wife and commissions construction of a summer home he will call the dunes, but villagers will dub the birdcage. With his own dreams of uh, summer residency in Southampton now a reality, Thomas takes steps to assure that some of his patients who would benefit most from the village's healthy sea air might join him there. To that end, he approaches the Hildreth family, proposing that they expand their farmhouse on Toilsome Lane to accommodate some of his uh, patients as boarders. In these years, following the 1870 arrival of the railroad in Southampton, greatly easing travel from the city, Thomas is the exception in building his own summer cottage. Even the well-heeled are happy to pay between seven and $14 a week for lodgings in one of the local boarding houses. The Hilders agree to the doctor's plan and in a description offered by a granddaughter of the proprietors, the 40 room Hildreth house is portrayed as very lively indeed. Beds not occupied by Thomas's patients are filled by some who are not at all ill. There are charades in the parlor and horses and carriages out in the barns with rooms attached for the coachmen who tack up pictures of their favorite trotting horses on the walls. The granddaughter, by the way, was my mother and I spent my summers in that big old house until it was torn down in the early 1950s. With definite ideas, not only for the design of his house on the dunes, Thomas is also eager to influence the development of the fledgling resort to accommodate a compatible community of so-called cottagers from among his friends and colleagues. While admiring Southampton's quaint charm and respectable villagers, he sees much room for improvement if the hygienic and cultural standards of a modern day resort are to be met. Like others from the city who follow his lead, he invests in local real estate, especially around Lake Agawam, and takes on a problem that has long plagued the lake, the unwholesome swamp at its northern end. In 1879, Thomas is instrumental in giving the, the south end of the lake its most picturesque landmark. In the belief that an Episcopal chapel would be a useful addition to attract, to attract summer cottages to the new summer colony, he purchases a, build, a building which is no longer in use by the government as a life-saving station and presents it to the church. Guided by Thomas and other founders from among the early organizers of Southampton's new summer colony, the building is then moved to its present location behind the dunes on land donated by C. Willis Betts. Over the years, its rest rustic interior will be filled with many treasures, including, sadly, a memorial window donated in 1897 by Thomas and his wife after the death of their son, Howard Lapsley Thomas of TB. In 1881, Thomas calls a meeting at his city home at 294 Fifth Avenue to propose formation of the Southampton Village Improvement Association, which is to draw its membership more or less evenly from resorters and villagers, but with an agenda clearly defined by the New Yorkers. The association will devote, it much, will devote much of its time and energy over the years to the making of the lake safe for boaters, bathers, yeah, bathers, fishermen, and not least for their houses ringing its shores. Another of their priorities is the creation of private clubs for socializing with one another and indulging in the hardy sports that will characterize Southampton's club life, tennis, swimming, golf, 
polo and other activities of the horsey set. Thomas is, his help, is himself known for his prowess on a horse. Despite the SBIA's many welcome contributions to village life, the organization's sometimes heavy-handed improvement campaign and its clubby exclusivity inevitably cause occasional tensions with the local population. When the cottagers overstep, they most often encounter resistance from Southampton's best known protector of the rights and dignity of its local residents, Captain George White. In the early 1880s, there are repeated reports in the newspapers that Dr. Dr. Thomas contemplates the erection of a large hotel near the beach in the neighborhood of Old Town Pond. Suspicions that this might turn out to be some seaside members only pleasure palace stirs concern and it's not allowed to happen. White goes to battle again when the cottagers offer to build a new village hall, presenting a costly plan, but no commi commitment to fund it. White campaigns to scrap the plan, a competi competition is organized locally and the handsome building that survives today is the design of a prominent New York City architect. White is a thorn in the side of those who disagree with him, but he has everyone's respect as a man of complete integrity and a fierce defender of local rights. Dr. Thomas, a giant in his field, is also held in the highest esteem as one of the city's top surgeons. And this at a time when it takes enormous courage, confidence, and skill to cut into a patient, especially a female patient. Surgeons are gods toward the end of the 19th century to the point that one skeptic writes that going under the knife has become a fad among the fashionable. So the stubbornly principled salty old sea captain and the city surgeon, so accustomed to reverence, might seem to be on a collision course over Southampton's future. Instead, they develop a deep mutual respect that is in the end much more. It's a genuine friendship and it expands to encompass White's whole family. In 1888, Thomas presents a beautiful red velvet album to White's wife with the inscription, Mrs. George G. White, with the kind regards of Dr. T. Guyar Thomas, Xmas 1888. It's now in the archives of the Southampton History Museum. Three years later, Thomas, congratulating White on his son's academic success, is addressing White as his dear old friend. The final decade of the 1880s has seen Thomas easing his workload in the city. He resigns from active duty at Women's Hospital in 1887, though he continues to operate his own private sanatorium until 1900 and to continue fulfilling some professional and consulting commitments. The paring down gives him more time to watch over the condition of Southampton's water and milk supplies, to carry on the endless struggle to eliminate Lake Agawam's impurities, and to spearhead the SVIA's ambitious tree planting program, as well as its efforts to keep the roads clean, watered, and properly illuminated. He remains active in the social life of Southampton as well at the golf club, the Meadow Club, the Southampton Club, and the various equestrian venues that are part of the social as well as the sporting life of the village. Southampton, which incorporates as a village in 1894, is growing. But three years later in 1897, there are still only five telephones in the village. The quaintness endures.
In 1901, Thomas is invited to speak at the Presbyterian Church in a memorial service following President McKinley's death from an assassin's bullet. With his rich, resonant, resonant voice and florid Victorian style, he predicts a day when children, quote, will hear with bated breaths from their great granddames what chanced on September 19, 1901, in this old church when the residents of Southampton did honor to their martyred, martyred president on the day of his burial, close quotes. That same year, in a more restrained goodbye, Thomas offers his resignation as president of the SBIA, assuring members that he does so with regret. And yet he says, having held the office for 20 years, I have grown old in the work and feel sincerely that a younger and more active man would greatly benefit the organization in which I have taken so much pleasure and pride in serving the village. Dr. Thomas dies suddenly while on vacation at Thomasville, Georgia on February 28, 1903, in his 71st year. An autopsy reveals that death was due to the rupture of an aortic aneurysm. He leaves a net worth of more than $1 million to his family. His wife, Mary, inherits the dunes, where she continues to summer until her death five years later. Their eldest son, J. Metcalf Thomas, takes over the house but sometime around 1930, it is demolished, allowing Jessie Woolworth Donahue to expand her Walden Manor estate. In 1913, Thomas's younger son, youngest son and namesake, builds the handsome brick house on South Main Street known as Thanet House, which survives to cause confusion over which T. Guy L. Thomas was the builder and owner. As the house was built 10 years after Dr. Thomas's death, there should be no reason to doubt that the house was built for the son and not the father. The entry for Dr. Thomas in Scribner's Dictionary of American Biography leaves no doubt about the high esteem in which he was held as a national figure. It concludes with these words. Thomas was a man of great culture, a born leader, and one who brought confidence and cheer into the sick room. He was kind, generous, and hospitable, and his friendship and advice were sought by many. He was a handsome, well-groomed man of robust build and medium height. Physically alert, he was known to be an excellent horseman. Close quotes. In Southampton, doc, Dr. Thomas is remembered especially for his tireless work at the helm of the Village Improvement Association, for providing a spiritual home for Southampton's fashionable Episcopalians who had no place to worship until he bought the old life-saving station, which became St. Andrew's Doom Church, and for his constant struggle to improve sanitary conditions in the village, especially around Lake Agawam, where the task of eliminating the pestilential swamp that was polluting it was a particular priority. And the swamp is gone, but uh, the efforts on behalf of Lake Agawam continue. So I conclude with that. That was great, Mary. Thank you. Um, anybody who might have any questions about today's talk, uh, please do feel free to submit them in either the chat function or the Q&A function down below. And I'll be sure to read all them off uh, to Mary to try and get some of the questions. Uh, so let's see. Uh, first one, where is his tombstone located? I believe it's in Southampton. I meant to recheck it by going over there, but... Um... I was a little surprised when I read that and a little doubtful because I, th I thought he'd go back to Georgia. Gotcha. <laughs> do, you, do you believe it's in the, the big cemetery by the- uh, 
Yeah. By 27? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a few people saying thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, and then is the is the Southampton Village Improvement Association active? Yes. They're still active today? Yeah. Okay, so leaving a lasting impression. Uh, let's see if anybody else has any questions, please do feel free to submit them. Um, and I will say, yeah, the uh, Lake Agawam, interesting to hear about his interest in preserving and trying to keep that uh, nice. And, and today it being not so much then that way anymore, but efforts are still there to try and make it better. Right, well, they used to swim in it. Terrifying prospect today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, uh, I spoke to one woman uh, before she died, and she said her mother lied to them and told them it had no bottom because she didn't like the idea, idea even then of swimming. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. I don't think we have any other questions. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and end today's talk. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, hopefully you guys can all join us in on some of our future programs. Remember to head over to southamptonhistory.org to find out about all the upcoming programs we have going on. And we'll see you then. Bye.